Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the ICRS webinar series 2021. You heard already the music from Mozart, the Nachtmusik, and now we are starting with our program for today. We have imaging in cartilage repair. Welcome from Vienna. Imaging in cartilage repair, music in the air with Amadeus and Mokart. It's a pleasure for me to welcome two um, members of the societies who are international experts in imaging, which is Professor Tratnik, Siegfried Tratnik from the Medical University of Vienna. He is a world famous radiologist for cartilage repair, and he will give us today an update about the MOCAT 2.0, which is a new version of the MOCAT score. And then we have another colleague working in Germany, which is Professor Gotz Welsh. He is experienced in the imaging of athletes. He developed also a lot of biochemical and new morphological imaging of cartilage repair. He was also the founder of the MOCART 3.0, the MOCART 3D score. And he will give us an update about the imaging in athletes. So welcome to this uh, webinar and I hope that you will join us and be uh, with us for the next two hours. I invite you also to send us questions. We will discuss all the questions in after our presentations. And I will start with a short presentation about cartilage imaging and what we know about the scoring systems. So, um, so welcome again to our imaging session, imaging and cartilage repair. So the imaging of cartilage and cartilage lesion is very important because we want to have a staging of cartilage defects. We have our acute and chronic defects and we want to know about the stage of these cartilage defects and where is the location and how big are these cartilage defects and we want to get an, an, an impression what we can do with these cartilage defects in our surgical approaches. Imaging is also very important for the staging of osteoarthritis. We have also different kind of operative and non-operative treatment options for osteoarthritis. And we need a staging protocol and this protocol can be delivered by MRI. So we have a quantitative and also qualitative assessment of cartilage in the staging of OR. And we want to have the imaging of cartilage for the monitoring of therapies. And new drugs are developed and we are using already drugs for the, for the cartilage repair and cartilage regeneration and the monitoring of these drugs and also our cartilage repair procedures is very important and a non-invasive possibility to monitor these therapies is MRI of cartilage. So if we have the imaging of cartilage, what is important? What you have to know about the basics of, of imaging. So how do we perform this imaging? Of course, we need good quality scanner. The standard scanner at the moment is 1.5 or 3 Tesla. We need dedicated coils for the imaging of cartilage repairs and we need it we need also special sequences and protocols for the imaging the important question is when we do the imaging so what is the time point of the imaging of the investigation of course after injuries but when we are doing cartilage repair, repair procedures what is the exact time point for the investigation when we should image a knee joint. And the other thing, what we see in imaging, how do we perform our reporting and are there any scores we can use to objectify our, our imaging pictures so that we can compare our 
cartilage repair procedures. And then that we can also uh, compare the, the outcome of different procedures worldwide. So in the MRI, we have the morphological MRI where we see the cartilage uh, in, in the pictures and we have different cartilage repair scoring systems. And we have also the new development of biochemical MRI, which is now in different studies examined. But the biochemical MRI is, I think, a technique for the future. The most important thing is the morphological MRI because it can be done in every country. And with, uh, with some kind of teaching, we can use different scores for the, for the morphological MRI. The biochemical MRI is very important to have the ultrastructure and the composition of the tissue. And so we can see in the future about the proto-clicans. We can also have also some information about collagen and we can have also a combination of different techniques to have this insight into the biochemical composition of cartilage. Coming back to the morphological MRI to the cartilage repair scoring system. Why do we need these scoring systems? We need scoring systems to compare our procedures to make it uh, validated, to validate our, our procedures. And in the end, to have also some scores which we can have for the regulation bodies for the FDA or for the EMA that we can uh, justify our new uh, repair modalities. The basic morphological examination is, of course, which should be done in every case where we look for cartilage defect. Of course, we have to look after the localization of the cartilage defect when we now look in the, in, in, in the knee. Then we have to describe if the, if the cartilage defect is located on the femur, the tibia, or on the patella. Then the second thing that we can have a look at the depth and the grade of cartilage defect. So we have a grading until grade four, where we have different kinds of cartilage defects coming down from superficial cartilage defects until full signet cartilage defects where the bone is already reached. And then we want to have an impression about the size of the cartilage defect. So a smaller size or a bigger size because the size is also determine our cartilage repair procedures. And then we have a look at the concomitant pathologies. Is there any injury or other changes to the meniscus or injuries to the ligaments? One last score which is used before we treat the patient is the Amadeo score, which means is the area measurement and depths and the underlying structures, which is an MRI cartilage lesion scoring system where we have three different kinds of uh, measurements. So we are measuring the area, we are measuring the defect depth, and we have a look under the underlying structures. And in the end, we get the Amadeus total score and the Amadeus grade. So let's have a look at this score in, in some detail. The first thing we measure is the error measurements. So we have determined the, the, the diameters in two different directions. And then we can measure the size and, and the area of the defect. Which is, which is giving us the first digit of this score. The second is that we look at the depth. So when we have no defect, we have the highest scoring with 20, po uh, 20 points. And then we have signal alteration, partial sickness defects, and full sickness. And in full sickness, we don't get any points for this uh, second digit. And the third thing is the underlying structure. So we are looking if there is any bony defect. If there is no bony defect, we get also a high scoring. And if we are having some kind of bony defect, small bony defect, we get 20 points. And in bigger bony defects, we have zero points. And then we have also no defect associated bone marrow edema, which has also an influence on this score. And 
if we put everything together, we have a um, grade and the number, this number is between zero and 100. 100 is the best scoring system we can have. So we have no cartilage defect and we have no cartilage pathology and a different kind of grading, which is also here summarized, degrading more than 75 points. We have grade one, grade two between 50 and 75, grade three between 25 and 50, and grade four less than 25 points. If you have some uh, um, examples of the scoring, then you see here some uh, examples where we have established and also examined the knee joint and the scoring is, is uh, under the, the pictures. So we have a low scoring if we have already changes in the bone. We have a low scoring if the defect of the cartilage is going down to the underlying bone. And here also some are scoring of other lesions where you see the defects on the female female condyle and very, very severe edema or a complete cartilage defect. The other thing which the Amadeus you can use before you treat the patient, before you have, uh, have some uh, cartilage repair procedures and you can quantify and establish the cartilage lesion and get a good parameter for the comparison of different cartilage lesions. For the evaluation of the cartilage repair procedures, uh, we developed also a validated scoring system, which we call the MOCOT score, which is a scoring system of nine different variables, which is uh, a, a very useful tool for the description of the cartilage repair procedures, where we have these kind of, um, of parameters with the filling of the defect, the structure, the surface, and also the description of the subcontinental bone, and also other things in the in the joint. In the first uh, the first version of the MOCA score, we had the cartilage def defect filling with complete or hypertrophy or incomplete filling. We had also the integration to the border zone with complete and incomplete. And we had also the surface, which can be intact or which can be damaged. And we had also the structure, which can be homogeneous or inhomogeneous. And then we had the signal intensity, intensity of the repair tissue, which can be moderate or iso-intensive, moderate hyper-intensive or marked hyper-intensive in the dual T2 uh, sequence or in the 3D sequences can be hyper intense, moderate and markedly. Then we had a description of the subchondral laminar, which can be intact or non-intact. And then we had also a description of the subchondral bone, which can be intact or non-intact. And then we had the development of the 3D MOCOD score, where we compared all the new parameters in the 2D MOCOD score, we had these nine parameters. And in the 3D MOCOD score, where we analyzed 3D sequences of the, of the images, there we had the new uh, parameters, which has been the integration to the cartilage and the integration of the repair tissue to the bone. And we had also the description of chondral osteophytes. And then it was, uh, um, clear that we need also a new version of the MOCAD score. And so we had the MOCAD 2.0 and which will be uh, presented in some minutes from Siegfried Tracknik. And he will give you also some uh, examples of this MOCAD score. In the end, it's a very easy uh, score for the, for the evaluation and description of cartilage repair techniques. So in summary, the cartilage scoring system is important to compare the outcome on different cartilage repair procedures. The scoring can be done also in daily practice, which is very important that you're not uh, losing too much time when you score the patients. The scoring can be done by different specialities like the radiologists and the surgeons. And 
that there is a significant, significant correlation between the morphological MRI and the clinical outcome, which makes it very important for us to have these, uh, these images. And the MOCAD is already validated score for the description of the repair tissue and the subcontrol bone. So this was my short introduction for the scoring and we are looking now forward for other uh, upcoming uh, events of the, of the ICRS, which is an ICRS webinar in October about hyaluronic based retrogenic cartilage repair. There's a new open access, access journal, which is also very important for the society. So if you are not a member of the society, become a member and get a professional network around the world. So I will hand over now to Siegfried Tratnit, who will give you a, an overview about the new version MOCAD 2.0, and he will give you some our nice examples how he is using the score in daily practice in the evaluation of cartilage repair tissue. Well, um, thank you very much, uh, Stefan, for this kind introduction. Hello, everybody. In my presentation, I will discuss the scoring of the modified uh, MOCAD score, which is called now the MOCAD 2.0 knee score. And I will also try to make a comparison with the original MOCAD score. As you heard already, uh, the MOCAD score was developed by Stefan Malowitz and me, I remember still the several night shifts what we had in the General Hospital of Vienna when we uh, thought about such a scoring system. And finally, we published uh, the first version of the MOCAD score in 2004 and uh, a second modified, slightly modified version in 2006. As you heard already, the original MOCAD score is based on nine variables and allows a non-invasive, standardized, reproducible, semi-quantitative, that's really important, semi-quantitative approach for the morphological assessment of cartilage repair tissue. And that's also really important. Uh, this scoring system is independent of MR scanner, of different types of MR scanner, but also of different vendors in MR uh, scanners and of the surgical procedure. Fortunately, we were really pleased to see that this uh, MOCAD score was uh, widely accepted in the orthopedic community. I checked the PubMed and found more than 277 publications with the MOCAD score and more than 750 citations where the MOCAD score is uh, mentioned. And uh, the same happens now with the new uh, the uh, MOCAD 2.0 score, the knee score, uh, which was published in 2019. And recently I checked the shuttle cartilage with its views and downloads. And I saw that we have now nearly 1,900 views and downloads and we are ranked on second place with, the, with this high number of views and downloads. So, I have the feeling that also the modified MOCA 2.0 is well accepted, uh, meanwhile, by the orthop orthopedic community. What was the reason why we wanted to upgrade the original, successful, and easy to handle MOCA score? First of all, there was a significant progress in surgical treatment of cartilage defects over the last decade because the uh, old MOCA score, the original one, is now 17 years old. And even more, there was a significant technical progress in MRI. Um, we have now more high field MR scanners operating at three tests available. We have a very, very tricky coil development, a very sophisticated coil development. Coil engineering has significantly progressed within the last decade. Now we have multi channel. Uh, receive coils, but we have also uh, transmit coils uh, and the sequence development in MRI also significantly improved. We have now more contrast and noise ratio in the sequences. We have better spatial resolution and many other factors which have really improved and promoted the MR examination of repair tissue. And finally, we also realized there are some weaknesses in the original MOCAD uh, 1.0 score which we also wanted to overcome by the 
modification and the upgrade to the MOCA 2.0 score. Well, uh, here you see on the left hand side the original MOCA score, on the right hand side the MOCA 2.0 NIS score in bold. What you should immediately recognize is that in the original MOCA score, we have altogether nine variables. In the new one, we have only seven variables. Uh, we removed the variables adhesion and diffusion from the original MOCA score, and we renamed the variable subhondral lamina uh, to bony defect uh, or bony overgrowth, and the variable subhondral bone was renamed as subhondral changes. Well, let's uh, move from one variable to the next one, and always a comparison between the original MOCA score above and the new MOCA score below. And uh, you can see also on the images with annotation uh, what uh, the different uh, subgroups in the variables really mean. Uh, first of all, the first variable is the volume field of the cartilage defect. And uh, volume already means we have changed it from the uh, two-dimensional evaluation in the original MOCAD score to a three-dimensional evaluation for the volume field of the cartilage defect. If there is a complete feeling of the defect or, and that's also new in the new MOCAD score in the upgrade, is minor hypertrophy, which means that we have 100 to 150% filling of the total defect volume is considered the same and considered an optimal outcome for the filling of the defect. So we have 20 points for both of them. Note that in the original Mokert score, any kind of hypertrophy was already abnormal and got 15 points. Here in the modified uh, MOCA 2.0, only the major hypertrophy, that means more than 150% filling of the total defect volume, which is considered clinically relevant, uh, is now 15 points. Or we have uh, an incomplete filling of the defect, an underfilling of 75 to 99% filling of the total defect volume. Note that we have now 25% steps in comparison to the 50% steps in the original MOCA score, which was relatively rough. That means we have this micro hypertrophy more than 150% or 75 to 99% filling of the total defect volume with 15 points. When we have 50 to 74% filling of the total defect volume, we have 10 points. If we have 25 to 49% feeling of total defect volume, we have five points. And finally, when we have less than 25% feeling of total defect volume or a complete delamination in situ or a delamination with a loss of tissue more than 50%, this is all really bad outcome and means zero points for the first variable. Uh, just to show an example without any annotations, the complete feeling of the defect. Note that this, in this particular case, we see here the repair tissue, the defect is nicely filled. However, we see that this is a severely abnormal signal intensity, which is markedly hypo intense. And this implies that there is some fibrous tissue which has formed here for the feeling of the defect. These are examples on the left-hand side where we have a minor hypertrophy, less than 150% of adjacent cartilage sickness. Whereas on the right side, we see a major hypertrophy, which uh, comprises here more than 150% of the adjacent cartilage sickness. This is an example of an underfilling of the defect with 76 to 99% filling of the defect. We have this 25% uh, steps now. This is shown here for the full cartilage uh, repair area. And here we have a bad outcome with less than 25% filling of the defect on both images here. The second variable is integration to adjacent uh, cartilage. And um, when we have a complete integration, that means there is no, no gap in between uh, the interface uh, between adjacent cartilage, healthy cartilage, and the repair tissue. If this is complete, it's 15 points. If we have a split like defect at this interface between repair tissue and native cartilage, 
which is two millimeter or less than two millimeter um, in thickness, which is fissure-like. It's 10. Note that for the first time we defined this original split-like demarcating board and the original Mokert score, which is now clearly defined uh, with a dimension. It's 10 points. Then if we have a defect, which is larger than the two millimeter at the interface between repartition and native cartilage, but it's less than 50% of the repartition length, then it's five points. And if this defect at the interface between repartition and native cartilage is more than 50% of the repartition length, then it's only zero points. Two examples for this incomplete integration, we see the visible defect, which is less than 50% of the repartition length at the interface between repartition and healthy cartilage. And another example here with the fat suppressed fast echo sequence, where we see that there's a visible defect less than 50% of the repartition length here. The next variable is the surface of the repair tissue. If the surface is intact, uh, we have 10 points available. If the surface is irregular, but less than 50% of the repair tissue diameter, it's five points. And note that in the original Mokert score, we claimed that it should be less than 50% of the repair tissue depth. And this was a little bit confusing because this, there was an overlap with the filling of the defect. And to avoid this confusion, this overlap, we have now, uh, we are now considering the surface irregularity with respect to the repartition diameter. And finally, when the surface is irregular, but more than 50% of the repartition diameter, uh, then it's only zero points. An example for the surface damage we see here. Uh, a surface which is damaged less than 50% of the repartition length. Let's move on to the next variable, which is the structure of the repartition. This is the only variable where we did not perform any modification from the original MOCAD score, the MOCAD 1.0 to the new, to the 2.0 MOCAD score. So either the repartition is homogeneous, which means 10 points, or it's heterogeneous, which means then zero points. Two examples of this heterogeneous repair tissue we see here on the left hand side this inhomogeneous repair tissue, as well as on the right hand side, where we have hypointense and hyperintense areas within the repair tissue here. The next variable is the signal intensity of the repair tissue. I want to mention in the beginning that in the original Mokert score, we had the following problem. This characterization of the signal intensity of the repartition was depending on the sequences used, as mentioned before by Stefan. So we had two sequences which were required, the dual fast echo sequence, as well as the 3D grained echo sequence, because both of them were charged. However, the 3D grained echo sequence, which has to be T1 weighted, was used 15 years ago but it's no longer used in MSK imaging of, of joints. So uh, this cannot be really used anymore. Therefore, it was necessary to uh, modify this variable in a way that we say for the signal intensity of repair tissue, if it's normal, it's 15 points. If it's minor abnormal, and this can be minor hyperintense as well as minor hypointense, and it's independent of the sequence used, it's 10 points. And finally, if the signal intensity is severely abnormal, either severely hyperintense, and we define it as almost fluid-like from the appearance on MRI images, or it's almost, or it's, it's uh, major, or severely uh, hyperintense, then we define it that the signal intensity has to be very close to the particle bone to the subonic bone plate, which is really, really dark and hyperintense, then it's zero points. And usually we use the fast spin echo sequences, either proton density, fat suppressed, or non-fat suppressed, or T2 fast spin echo sequences to perform this kind of signal intensity evaluation of the repair tissue. So we are now really independent of the sequences, which were still uh, the case with the original Mokert score. To show you examples for the signal intensity of the repair tissue, 
as a minor normal signal in this repair tissue, which is hyper intense on this fast and echo photon density fat saturated image. Another example here is also minor abnormal signal intensity of the repair tissue, but here it's hypo intense, as it can be seen here. And finally, we have here a severely abnormal signal intensity on this non fat suppressed uh, photon density fast and echo sequence. And uh, we see that it's really, it's really dark, it's really hypo intense. And we know that if we see this kind of hypo intensity, it mostly resembles uh, fibrous tissue here. The next variable is the bony defect or um, uh, the bony overgrowth. Um, note that for the first time we introduced here the bony overgrowth, which was not part of the original MOCAD score, but we realize now more and more that with long-term follow-up of patients of the cartilage repair surgery, more and more bony overgrowths can be seen. So if there's no bony defect or bony overgrowth, we have the maximum of 10 points. If we see a bony defect, which is in depth less than the thickness of adjacent cartilage, or we see a bony overgrowth, which is less than 50% of adjacent cartilage, which is shown here on this annotated images, and it's five points. If we have a bony defect where the depth is more than the thickness of adjacent cartilage, as seen on the annotated image here, or we have an overgrowth of more than 50% of adjacent cartilage where more of the substance of the repair tissue is already covered by a bony structure, then we have zero points. To show you an example here, we have here a bony defect where the depth is less than the thickness of adjacent cartilage, which is shown here in the repair tissue area with the bony defect here. And this is a bony defect, but the depth is for sure more than the sickness of adjacent cartilage. It's a more severe bony defect in the repair tissue area. And for the bony overgrowth, we have two examples here on the left hand side on this fat suppressed protein density fast echo image. We see um, there is uh, a minor bony overgrowth, which is less than 50% of adjacent cartilage sickness. Whereas on the right hand side here, we see a bony overgrowth which comprises more than 50% of adjacent uh, cartilage thickness. And finally, what I want to tell you, which is important, uh, there's a severe bony overgrowth in this particular uh, case uh, where most of the cartilage repair tissue is already replaced by this bony overgrowth. And usually this bony overgrowth is better seen on non-fat saturated sequences in comparison the fat saturated sequences, what you can see here on the right hand side. Well, the uh, next variable is the subhondral changes. Originally, in the original MOCAD score, we only had subhondral bone intact or not intact, and the non intact comprised every, every signal alteration below the repair tissue and the subhondral bone. Now we have subhondral changes and we have significantly raised the point, the number of points for this particular variable because we believe that this variable is of importance. If there are no major subhondral changes, we have uh, 20 points. If there's a minor edema like marrow signal, where the maximum diameter is less than 50% of the repair tissue diameter, it's 15 points. If we have a severe edema-like marrow signal where the maximum diameter is more than 50% of the repair tissue diameter, we have 10 points. If we have subhondral cysts, which have a diameter in the longest dimension of uh, five millimeter or more than five millimeter, or we see an osteonecrosis-like signal, as you can see on these images here, then this is the worst case scenario. We have then zero points here. So what we did is we really considered uh, important subhondral changes like bone marrow edema, as well as subhondral cysts, as well as osteonecrosis like signal alterations here. To show examples, we have here on the left hand side a minor edema, less than 50% of the repair tissue length. And on the right hand side, we see a major edema, which is more than 
and 50% of the reaper tissue length. So to summarize my presentation and to give you some take home messages. What did we change with the upgrade from MOCA 1.0 to MOCA 2.0? First of all, the volume, we now define the volume of the defect filling, which now differs in 25% increments. This is because we have now higher spatial resolution imaging available in MR, and therefore I think it's reasonable that we can now better assess uh, the feeling of the defect with this 25% increments. We have now hypertrophic feeling of up to 150% is the same points as complete feeling because this is clinically not yet relevant. More than 150% hypertrophic feeling uh, is clinically relevant and therefore um, we should consider uh, hypertrophic feeling of less than 150% feeling of the total defect volume still as a complete feeling. The speed like incomplete integration was now defined with a number. It's now two millimeter or less than two millimeter. It's usually a fissure like separation at the interface between repartition and uh, adjacent healthy cartilage. The surface irregularities are now assessed in comparison to repartition length and not what we have done in the original MOCAD score to the repartition depth. And there was some confusion and also an overlap with the feeling of the defect in the old original MOCAD score. And the signal intensity is now independent of the sequence used. We don't need any more as the one weighted 3D grained echo sequence that we can define the hypointensity of the repartition in this particular sequence, which shows cartilage very bright. We are really independent of the sequence itself. Usually, and the workhorse for MSK imaging of joints um, in MR are the protein density weighted or the two weighted uh, fast echo sequences with or without fat saturation. And now we define the signal intensity as normal, minor abnormal, or severely abnormal signal. And the abnormal means it can be hyper as well as hypo-intense because both is not normal anymore. And uh, the variables adhesions and diffusion were removed. Why? Adhesions were relatively common in the first generation of polygos chondrocyte uh, implantation of ACI. However, they are rarely found now in the matrix associated uh, chondrocyte transplants. That means in a later generation, we really don't see adhesions anymore. They are really rare. And effusion is uh, the whole joint uh, phenomenon. It's not related to the focal area of the transplant. Effusion can have a, different, a lot of different uh, reasons. Therefore, we believe it's not suitable anymore to be included in the MOCAD evaluation. We have renamed the variables on the lamina from the original MOCAD score to bony defect and bony overgrowth. And this has now a higher uh, rating or a higher score with 10 instead of original five points as the maximum. And the subhondral bone variable was renamed to subhondral changes. And uh, it assesses now and it can differentiate between minor and severe edema like neural signal. Subhondral cysts or osteonecrosis like a signal with a higher score, which we dedicated to this particular variable from five in the original MOCA to 20 in the MOCA 2.0. Nevertheless, the overall maximum points you can achieve for a perfect outcome with the MOCA 2.0 score is still 100 points and this number did not change to the original MOCAD score, which allows a comparison between the two scores regarding the maximum number uh, which you can achieve with your repair tissue. Recently, we published an article where we compared the inter-rater and inter -rater variability between the MOCAD, the original MOCAD score with the MOCAD 2.0 knee score. And the MOCA 2.0 knee score showed a higher inter-rater reliability than the original MOCA score with an interclass coefficient of 0 0.875 versus 0 0.759 in the original MOCA score, ranging from 0 0.86 in a microfracturing group to 0 0.878 in the ECI group. The inter-rater reliability was good with an overall 
ICC of uh, 0.860 and 0.866 respectively. And to summarize, uh, we can say now, because of this results, that the MOCA 2.0 knee score enables now the assessment of cartilage repair tissue after different cartilage repair surgery techniques, which comprises the autologous chondrocyte implantation, the matrix associated chondrocyte implantation, the osteochondral repair techniques, but also microfracturing, as well as for the different lesion types. Uh, with uh, a really good intra and interrata reliability. Yes, uh, high resolution is not only important for MI imaging, but also in astronomy. And uh, recently, I was lucky enough to make these images uh, of a double, of the rare double transit of Jupiter moons. It was Ganymede and Europa, and the shadows on the surface of Jupiter. On the left hand side, you can also see uh, the moon Io. Um, and when you look carefully, you can even see some details on the moons already. And this is really uh, surprising for uh, an amateur astronomer to achieve images thanks to the high space resolution we can achieve now in our hobby. With this, I thank you very much for your attention. And of course, after the session, I'm open for uh, questions and discussions. Thanks a lot. So thank you very much, Iggy, for this nice update and comparison of the different MOCAD scores. And uh, if you want to see the original publication, go to the Cartilage Journal, which is the official journal of the ICRS. There you can find the atlas of the imaging. There you can find all the examples. And we will have definitely time after the next presentation to discuss some questions with you, Sigi. So I will handle now over to Gerd Welsh, who is, will give us an update about the imaging in athletes, what we have to consider there, what is the outcome of cartilage imaging in athletes. Please, Gerd, welcome that you are joining our meeting here. Could you please unmute? Yes, 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 yes. Sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you for the nice introduction. So I will start with um, um, the use of cartilage MR imaging in athletes and try to focus uh, on um, the following points. So first I want to so for the for the background, I'm I'm uh, orthopedic and trauma surgeon working very much now in sports, in professional sports, and have a large or long MR history. So I try to put uh, these things uh, together, and um, so I will focus on the problem in professional sports. I uh, try to give an overview on the injuries and pain during and after the career. Um, try to look how MRI can help us and um, yeah we'll have a look on cartilage injuries especially the acute and chronic ones um, so what want or what do I have to do I will focus a little bit on the role on of bone marrow edema inflammation and pain especially in the background of imaging and um, try to yeah, give you my ideas on multifactorial diagnosis and treatment and we'll have a look at our team during and after the career. So one <clears throat> famous German uh, guy uh, told that uh, great sports begins at the point where it has eased to be healthy. So. Um, this is, uh, to be honest, relatively true, especially when you see the MR images I will provide you. So uh, not also Bertolt Brecht, also the newer newspapers, um, yeah, they told on 2006, here's Bastian Schweinsteiger, a German uh, football player, soccer player, uh, they titled The Healthy Knee, 10 years later, at the end of his career, uh, they titled professional soccer uh, produces invalids. So um, yeah, and I will give you some examples for this journey and hopefully we can um, for it, yeah, for at least in some of those guys stop this journey. 
So the injuries during a career are different areas on the body. I think it's everyone clear and the knee I will focus on today is very often um, yeah, part of it. So in active uh, football, soccer players, um, 64% of them uh, told that they had a meniscus lesion, 42% told that they have a cartilage lesion, 33% uh, reporting on collateral ligament lesion and 27 on cruciate ligament lesions. So when we have a look after the career, um, <clears throat> In the knee joint, 47% report on pain in the knee, 48% on OA in the knee, and 6% uh, have total joints. So when we look now on two um, yeah, MRIs on the left side and on the right side, they are more or less the same age. And um, both of them playing yeah, professional football in the first league and in the national team. And on the left side, we have a knee um, yeah, where the big sports used to be healthy and on the right side, uh, we have a healthy one. And um, what is the difference in between those two images of those two different players? For first of all, there are injuries happening, overload, uh, lack of regeneration, maybe the wrong training techniques, too much training and maybe too short return to play. When we have this problem, we all know this problem, we all know those guys in our practice or our daily practice, um, how can literature and especially in terms of MRI help us? So this is an interesting um, yeah, study. They are looking on 44 uh, asymptomatic novice mar marathon runners and they performed MRI before the marathon, two weeks after and six, six months after marathon. And they see a significant improvement in their condition of bone marrow and cartilage. So you see here on the left side, a nice MRI or more or less nice MRI before the run. Then two weeks after the run, you had this bone marrow edema in the um, patella. And six months afterwards, it, uh, yeah, yeah, it is away again. So um, not... Yeah, so the first message is we also have to focus not only on what we see, but also on what kind of sports and how often they do it. So in another um, relatively new um, <clears throat> publication, um, they are looking on 24 asymptomatic collegiate uh, basketball players, and they do the MRI prior and following the end of the season. And they see that the cartilage injury score increased significantly in the postseason compared with the preseason. And it was very significant. So you see here an MRI from the preseason where more or less everything looks good. And after the season, um, not much looks good anymore in the cartilage uh, above the lateral meniscus. And um, so during one season, many things can happen. And the problem very often is not the one marathon they are running, but the uh, repetitive games and games and games and the repetitive load they have during a season. So what could we do now? We all know working on cartilage repair that we have those different techniques. We have microfracture, we have uh, different ACI techniques and we have um, those mosaic um, plastic uh, techniques, also contra transfers. Um, nevertheless, when you're looking into uh, professional um, sports, everyone tries to do a non-operative management and conservative treatment of the knee. And there we don't have many, um, yeah, much literature available. So what is happening then? And another thing we know that at least in the most of the uh, professional leagues, ACI or really cartilage transplantation, uh, cells, tra cell transplantation techniques are not used that much. So we have a big overload of the non-operative treatment and there we need imaging even more to see what is happening with those athletes. So this is one of them. Uh, here we had the possibility to image him 
every year and after you see here after removement or part partial removement of the lateral meniscus the posterior area and we see here over the years that this cartilage defect uh, or this cartilage defect develops over time and yeah what should we do with him nevertheless he could play every year and the pain was not that much so uh, we always have to think the first thing does surgery make sense and if cartilage surgery is done the reason for the cartilage defect has to be addressed and this is not possible in this case because the meniscus uh, cannot be um, yeah transplanted or can be but not in professional um, players and what is the best of the patient and how those images help us so one very important part of this especially if you want to have an idea if this is an acute injury if this is more chronic injury and especially if uh, the injury is deteriorating or not the cartilage defect um, is the bone marrow edema it's very essential uh, also to assess the mechanics or the mechanism of an injury or of what is going on in the knee. Uh, nevertheless, the differentiation in between new, acute and old chronic is not really possible only by MRI. Um, and the next problem is bone marrow edema can be found in about 25% of asymptomatic question mark knees in professional soccer players the, it's also um, um, yeah recent publication on it however it's nevertheless very often correlated to other pathological findings so in my eyes the bone marrow edema is important to see really what and where something is going on in a knee and in cartilage repair it's often a measure of ongoing or the development of OA again and um, there we have nice uh, nice work on of the group in Bologna where they see that uh, cross-sectionally more or less two or three years after surgery the bone marrow edema and the patients are um, yeah on a, on a um, lowest point and after a while they will rise again so the next thing which maybe helps us and oh no Sorry, and um, this is the, the player I showed you before, before and there you see that uh, yeah, a very light bone marrow edema is developing over time. Nevertheless, it doesn't look that much and um, no effusion is developing and yeah, and this guy really has more or less not very big problems. So this is another uh, case there, uh, it looks a little bit different. So this is only one year in between, it's also a professional player. And there we really had uh, yeah, more problems developing over time. Um, the um, cartilage on the lateral um, condyle uh, yeah, is not there anymore. And um, uh, yeah, relative relevant bone marrow edema starts. And we have something what you see here a little bit, but what you see in this image is much more that inflammation is coming into this knee. And this is a second uh, very important uh, point on if you want to have an idea if um, an athlete or a patient really has problems with his knee or not. So there's a very, very uh, interesting article of a Canadian group and they say the evaluation of knee pain in athletes, a radiologist perspective. And they are telling in the abstract the etiology of knee pain in knee athletes is multifactorial, a good history focus on the mechanism of injury and the chronicity of pain is extremely useful in correlating with radiologic, uh, radiological findings and establishing a clinical meaningful diagnosis. So you really need everything and not only the images if you want to uh, know what is going on in the knee. So you need a good combination um, in between the MRI and the, um, yeah, and what is going on with, this, with the athlete and what happened to the knee. So you need, um, yeah, you need to talk to the guys, the radiologists need to talk to the, 
surgeon or to the orthopedic uh, sports medical guy and maybe he has to talk to the physiotherapists and so on so this is in my eyes very very important especially if you treat um, professional athletes that you really use every information of everyone in the large team you have to get at the end an idea what to do with those knees and what to do with those knees also there you need a multifactorial yeah treatment uh, very different kinds of treatment injections physiotherapy and 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 um, you also need much training for those guys that uh, those knees will stand this uh, their, their career of an athlete the other problems i um, yeah show you here on the left side an image of another player um, after acl surgery he has uh, severe problems in the tibia as you see here and um, the other problem than pain are yeah the other parts around the knee and this is something what uh, we studied in our players in the last years so we performed a study of over 80 players we used the medical um, when they came to our club um, of both knees and there for example you have an image of a uh, um, cartilage defect in the trochlea and um, also in the patella, as you see here on the right side. And this guy, for example, uh, has recurrent muscle problems in the rectus femoris. So you see in many of uh, those yeah, deficient knees problems in the muscles of the thigh. And next image shows another, um, yeah, this guy I showed, I showed you before with the cartilage defect at the lateral femoral condyle and he always had problems in the hamstring um, muscles so there really uh, we have another correlation where we also need again mr imaging and uh, we if we want to treat either the knee or the um, the muscle we have to know that there is a correlation in between those problems so at the end, I want to show you our players. So this is an um, yeah, MRI uh, of uh, players of our team. And uh, when we will have a more specific look on the MRI and on the cartilage problems, we see, we see that we have a, a team um, mean of 24 years and the grade of contralesions of 1.9 uh, with the outer bridge um, yeah, system. So, however, we only have, we not only have active uh, players, so we also have those guys after their career. And um, I, always, I also tried to find some of those guys and this looks a little bit or much worse. So this is, uh, uh, yeah, those are 11 former uh, professional soccer players, which I see. And there you see that uh, they are not that old. And nevertheless, the cartilage uh, problems are yeah, really high in this group of players. And um, when you look at their games, they, this guy here, for example, with the health knee has 500 games, but all the others have yeah, relevant uh, games in the first or second uh, league. And they also have a relevant problem in their knees, very many of them starting with an ACL rupture. And those four had to, um, yeah, had to end their career before they really have to end in terms of age. So. This guy, for example, has to end his career after 13 games, this one after 60 games, so very early after an ACL rupture. And um, when they come to you, they need therapy. This one, for example, gets uh, PRP or hyaluronic acid therapy. This guy here uh, gets surgery of his, um, yeah, his torn meniscus. He had... Um, cartilage repair procedure, mosaic plasty in the trochlea. The next one 
has an <clears throat> osteotomy of his femur, femur and the last one yeah what if you go to the stages um, yeah you get a total knee so you find your individual problems in your active and in your former athlete and you have to yeah find also an individual diagnosis and a stepwise therapy for them to conclude also mri is sport specific most cartilage injury acute and chronic ones in the end athletes are usually treated non-operatively at least until the end of their career then surgery starts as i showed you at the end you really need a multifactorial diagnosis where mri is a very very important part of it but not only use mri for diagnosis bone marrow edema, inflammation, and especially pain is in my eyes very essential part. And maybe more than the cartilage lesion itself. One reason of muscle injuries are cartilage lesions in the knee and multimodal treatment and specific training yeah, is very essential for the athlete and for sure all other of our patients as well. So thank you very much for listening. And I try to give now back to Stefan and um, yeah, looking forward for your questions. So thanks, thank you very much for this nice presentation. So I invite you to send us our questions and we will have our discussion now. And we got already one question, which is, a technical question, Sigi. We are now we have listeners from more than 40 countries worldwide. In your institution, of course, you have the best scanners. So what is the minimum technical requirement for the evaluation of cartilage? And what is the minimum technical requirement for the, for the use of the MOCAD score? Well, uh, very good question, of course because we know that we have uh, so many different MR scanners available. Uh, but what I can tell you from my experience is the higher the ma magnetic field strength is, the better it is. That means if you have access to a three Tesla MR unit, then definitely make use of it because the higher the magnetic field strength, the better the chance to achieve a high spatial resolution within a short scan time or a shorter scan time. So if there's any chance to come to a sweet Tesla, then it's fine. But I'm absolutely aware that worldwide from the around 40,000 MR scanners, uh, two thirds of them are still 1.5 Tesla. And um, you can also perform cartridge imaging at 1.5 Tesla, but then you have to use a dedicated knee coil or the dedicated uh, uh, coil for the joint you are examining. That's important. The coil uh, engineering has significantly improved over the last years. That means if you have a very good coil, you can compensate for the uh, static magnetic field. That means a sweet Tesla system with a poor quality knee coil does not perform better than a 1.5 Tesla MR scanner with a sophisticated, uh, dedicated knee coil with mighty channel receive elements, for example, uh, can do the same job like the sweet Tesla with a poor quality coil. So uh, take care that your coil is a really good one. I use your 1.5 Tesla, which is should be available, uh, and uh, think of a protocol which really tries to improve the spatial resolution by the sequence protocol in a way that you have not two six slices and uh, the implant resolution uh, should be in a range that you can really visualize and, and semi-quantitatively assess all these characteristics of the repair tissue, what I have described in the MOCA 2.0 score. But this requires um, a higher spatial resolution. And therefore, it's really important that you tell your application specialist of your MR vendor who provided the MR scanner to your institution that he should really provide you with a really high resolution protocol where the signal to voice ratio is still acceptable, but you have a very 
good image quality with higher spatial resolution. I think then you are ready for cartilage imaging, you are ready for the MOCAD scoring. Thank you very much for the answer. You know, you trained a lot of surgeons, you trained a lot of radiologists uh, to, to evaluate the cartilage pictures, especially also for the MOCAD score. So what do we think, how long time the training for the MOCAD score needs and what is the efficient way to learn the use of the MOCAD score? Can be done this with an atlas? Should be done this with uh, teaching? So what is your approach there? Uh, well, it really depends on your experience, of course. If you are um, experienced in MR imaging, the MOCAD uh, assessment or the MOCAD score can be uh, learned uh, relatively fast. That means we have now published the MOCAD 2.0. We have also published an atlas, which really helps to get uh, used to the different variables and how they look like in the images. Um, what you really need is some training in MR imaging, because if you are not really experienced in MR imaging, it's very difficult to apply the MOCAD score because you have to read the images first and based on the characteristics of the images, you can then define uh, the different variables in the MOCAD score and you can really uh, see the subcategories within the variables. So some, I think some basic experience in MR imaging is really required that you can really use the MOCAD score. But once you have some basic experience in MR imaging and you are really used to the standard MR sequences, which are used in, in joint imaging, for example, the fast spin echo, proton density or T2 weighted uh, sequences, the workhorse, which is always used in MSK imaging, in joint imaging, once you are familiar with this particular sequence, I think it's not really difficult to learn how to apply the MOCAD score on such a sequence. And now the sequence is sufficient that you can really um, evaluate all variables within the MOCA 2.0 score. On the other hand, for the already experienced radiologists who have already a training in MI imaging, I think the MOCAD score also helps them uh, to perform a really structured reporting of the cartilage repair tissue outcome, yeah? because they learn what characteristics they have to consider and should evaluate and should assess. And so it can be even integrated into the clinical routine um, diagnostic uh, process. So for both parties, the, the surgeons who should get some basic training in MR imaging, but vice versa, for the radiologists, both, I think both groups can really benefit from uh, this MOCAD scoring. Thanks for the answer. So we got another question, you know, coming from the international uh, uh, people listening to this webinar. In our countries, we have a good payer system for the medical evaluation and the medical MRIs. In other countries, we don't have this access and we don't have also the payment for the MRI. So what is the time point after a cartilage procedure where we should do the MRI for the follow-up? I want to give the, the question to both of you. So what is the time point where we should evaluate the, the cartilage repair procedure after of those six months, 12 months, two years, because we have a lot of uh, countries where MRI is not available so, so frequently and is also not paid in all the circumstances. Uh, well, uh, from my experience in many clinical trials uh, where we did the uh, MRI imaging and where we performed the uh, uh, MOCAD scoring in this, in the clinical trials, my experience is we can expect that it takes at least one year for the maturation of the repair tissue and most of this cartilage repair surgery procedures. So one year is a very good time point for the first follow-up exam. Um, two years, we expect that everything should be done. That means the repair tissue should be uh, optimal then after two years. And if you're interested in a long-term outcome, of course, five years an optimal time point. In the particular case that you have uh, these problems with the payment system, then I would recommend that if you have only one time point, you can really use um, within the system, which um, helps you to define the outcome of the cartilage repair tissue. I would recommend after two years. This is a very good time point because 
at this time, everything should be fine. Everything should be done with the maturation process as we know it from several trials. So this would be if I have only the chance to perform one MR examination uh, in this particular patients after cartilage reaper surgeries, I would highly recommend to do it after two years. Thanks very much. Götz, what is your approach for the time point? It depends a little bit on, on how active the patient wants to be. I totally agree to Siggy with the two years. It's the most important one for sure as everything is done. And we also see this in a biochemical MRI that we really have a development between 12 and 24 months in the tissue, in the subchondral bone and everywhere. Nevertheless, if you have an athlete who, for example, wants to start sports again, the one year uh, follow up also is important to, to see if everything is fine and if he can uh, start with maybe an impact sports again. So besides his, uh, his clinical um, yeah, performance, pain, muscles, and, and, and the MRI is one part which we used for the return to play to be yeah, more or less sure or as sure as we can be that everything is where it should be and how it should be and that we can send those guys back on, on to the pitch. Um, so, um, yeah, and then the five years is very important, nevertheless, I think, because we all want to know what happens in a mid to long term to those patients. Thanks. Götz, we got the clinical question also, you know, if you think that the ACI, ICI procedure or MACI procedure at early stages of cartilage injury will improve the long-term performance of a player. So would you recommend to do these procedures in the early stage of cartilage injuries? And this would be then cost-effective? Well, this is a really good question. Um, it's very hard. I think uh, it depends on, on the player. And I think if you have, for example, a young player, which maybe is 18, 19, 17, 18, 19, if you would do an ACI uh, procedure to his knee, it takes him 15 to 18 months to come back if you take the time. And I don't think that... Uh, after this really very long period of time, he will come back uh, because especially for the young players, uh, this yeah, is too long. And this is also the reason why you have so yeah, very, very few players around with a, uh, with a cartridge transplant a transplantation technique. So, and I think if you have an early cartilage defect, um, maybe really try to, to get an idea why uh, this guy has uh, the cartilage problem and try to address the, um, the cause of the problem. And um, then you have to talk to him and tell him, okay, we have the therapy. I think it would be not bad for the knee in the long term, but then maybe he has to stop his career. So this is, this is really uh, a question. Yeah. This is a problem. Nevertheless, I think on the other hand, the big problem is that if you don't do anything and you don't do surgery, they don't they they don't stop playing, and you know, and they maybe take painkillers. They keep on uh, playing. The coach asks, okay, why he cannot uh, uh, why he cannot play because he has no surgery. The doctor says, okay, we don't have to do a surgery, so he has to play the next weekend. And this is the problem, and maybe this is the best thing of surgery that you have a very clear and long period of rehabilitation. And um, but nevertheless, I think to be honest, if you have an early cartilage defect in a professional, young professional uh, player, the defect will develop uh, into a more severe problem. But nevertheless, he many of them can. Yeah, um, have a long career. So, and this is what they know, and this is why they want to do surgery. So, it's a hard question. Thank you very much for your answer. Sigi, we had another technical uh, question. What is the use of contrast agents in the MRI of cartilage? What is the role of the uh, contrast agents? Are you using this? 
and in what conditions you are recommending using these contrast media? Well, uh, in principle, contrast agent or contrast enhanced imaging does no uh, play no role in, in cartilage imaging in general. Uh, many years ago, we have uh, used a contrast agent in, in the special technique, which is called the GEMRIC, the delayed uh, gadolinium enhanced MI of cartilage. This was a special technique which helped us to define the glucosamine glycan concentration and content within the cartilage tissue to find focal defects, uh, which can be seen on this special GAG specific uh, technique, but was not yet seen on morphological MI. So the early stages of disease or of cartilage degeneration um, show us a loss of glucosamine glycans without any morphological changes. And therefore this degeneric method was uh, for many years uh, the method of choice for the detection of the earliest changes of cartilage degeneration or the early stages of uh, osteoarthritis. However, as we know, within the last years, um, there was this problem of the MR contrast agents, in particular the linear-based compounds of MR contrast agents, which showed the position in the brain. And uh, with this moment on, there was a lot of discussion and, and controversy about the use of uh, contrast, MR contrast agents in general in the medical community. And meanwhile, we know exactly that uh, the linear compounds really lead to permanent depositions of gadolinium in the brain. Although there is no single report yet published which shows any correlation with clinical symptoms or any diseases, but there is a deposition of gadolinium in the brain. On the other hand, the macrocyclic compounds do not show this deposition in the brain. They do also show some deposition in the brain, but this is washed out after several weeks. So, the, for example, in Europe, the EMA has removed the linear MR contrast agents from the market. And unfortunately, Magnevist, which uh, was used for the GEMRIC for many, many years, is now no longer allowed in Europe. Uh, and the only what we can do is, if we still want to use the GEMRIC, is that we have to change the macrocyclic uh, compound or macrocyclic uh, MR contrast agent. Dotarem is one possible candidate for this. But anyway. The GEMRIC is a complex procedure. It's uh, for biochemical analysis of cartilage. It's of, it, of interest, uh, but in clinical practice, it's not really used. And for morphological MR imaging, I don't see any, any benefit of uh, intravenous contrast application. I don't see a really benefit of uh, intraarticular contrast administration for MR. We have now a really good image quality with our MR scanners. We have very good coils. Uh, we can nicely visualize uh, all the cartilage layers uh, in joints and can uh, assess uh, the different grades, as you mentioned it in your talk, uh, with the Amadeo score and so on. And we can nicely use the MOCAD scoring in the postoperative uh, cartilage evaluation. So there's, in my mind, there's definitely no role for contrast agent enhanced MI. Thank you very much for this clear, clear statement. Uh, we have another question uh, gets about the role of microfracturing in cartilage repair in athletes. What is your experience and what is your uh, you know, vision on this microfracturing in athletes? I think it's Gagan. <clears throat> I think like years ago, everyone did microfracture for athletes. And I think it's getting less and less because uh, you always get, or not always, but very often get the problems with the subchondral bone plate and those intralesional osteophytes after a while. And um, I think like those one-step procedures uh, yeah, with minced cartilage or anything like this or combination one-step procedures, uh, maybe also together with, uh, with some um, stem cells and, and, and are right now uh, more often done than this normal microfracture technique. And what I see uh, is also that more and more um, yeah, osteochondral transfer, so mosaic plastic is done for smaller defects. 
And um, so in my eyes, microfracture is getting less and those other techniques are getting yeah, more important. Thanks sir, for this view. So uh, coming back to our MRI examination, what uh, is the view on the panel on the correlation between the MRI and the clinical outcome? So what is the actual status of the literature? What is uh, the statement of our experts? Correlation between MRI and clinical outcome. Well, um, there have been several reports and meta-analysis studies which have tried to find correlation with different variables, for example, of the Lopert score. And as I remember, there have been some correlations between feeling of the defect in the Mokert score and clinical outcome, as well as with uh, the signal intensity of the repair tissue, there has been some correlation. And uh, also if there's subhondral edema, but this is always uh, a field of controversy, if subhondral edema is also um, some, some uh, marker for, for outcome. Um, I believe that uh, what, what we have to do as radiologists is that we should assess the morphological appearance of the repair tissue. Is the outcome in a way that we can really uh, see that everything went well with the procedure, with the surgical procedure. And in the best case, because I have done a lot of clinical trials, in the best case, when I try to analyze an MR examination of a patient from which I know that he had a cartilage repair surgery in the past, the best situation is if you have a difficulty to find the area of the repair tissue. So that means uh, you can have outcomes where you can no longer differentiate between the focal cartilage um, uh, repair tissue and the healthy cartilage. That's one aspect. Um, uh, the, the second, uh, the second uh, opinion or the second aspect, uh, what I have is that um, we, we focus on, on, the, on the focal cartilage defect and we focus on the repair of this focal cartilage defect. However, we know that this is considering the whole joint uh, field or the whole joint origin, uh, we have only a small area which was really treated and there are so many other compartments or components of the knee joint, for example, which can also pose clinical problems. So it's really difficult to correlate uh, the clinical, the clinical uh, symptoms uh, with a focal locally cartilage repair procedure, because we know that in a knee joint with synovitis, with, with other cartilage lesions, um, and with problems of the ligaments, we can also have other sources or, or reasons uh, for the clinical symptoms of the particular patient. So it's always difficult to uh, directly correlate a focal area in a large joint which was treated uh, with the clinical symptoms. I would be very careful with this. Um, so, what is what is your yeah, I, I, correlation? I wanted to uh, share something. Um, yeah, what Siggy told is, is totally right. However, I think, um, so I see it from another point of view because the, the literature is those meta analysis which are there, they say, okay, in some parts you have this clinical correlation. But nevertheless, if you have a patient uh, coming to you having problems in his knee, maybe two years after cartilage repair surgery, it helps. The MRI helps you very, very much to, and this is in my eyes very, uh, very easy to see if the cartilage, uh, the area of cartilage repair is really a part of this problem or not. So, and therefore, I think if you evaluate a patient either in the return to, to sport, uh, return to activity algorithm, or if he is coming to, ye, uh, to you with clinical problems, you the MRI is always part if you really want to know what is going on in the knee. So if you see, for example, the area of cartilage repair is looking okay, you don't have a bone marrow edema, you don't have a delamination, maybe you have a little bit of underfilling, but uh, also the subchondral bone, you don't have an ostophyte, 
and um, then you can concentrate on other reasons for his problem and um, if you see yeah problems in the area of cartilage repair you know that is probably uh, causing his problems this area of cartilage repair so i think really to differentiate in between if the area of repair is part of the problem of the patient or not imaging is very very important uh, tool thanks for your answer are you using any other radiological methods besides mri if you are if you have a your athletes coming to your office and you want to evaluate uh, the repair procedure of course you're making the mri and also combining other other methods like ultrasound or ct scans um, I do, to be honest, I do many or very, very much ultrasound. Uh, always when I have the, the players or the athletes with me, because I, I think the combination, for sure you do an MRI to some time point, but then the ultrasound to see the progression, you see the osteophytes, uh, the development of the osteophytes, very, very good in ultrasound. In some areas, you also can see the cartilage within good ultrasound. You can see the effusion, you can see uh, the inflammation in parts, uh, you can uh, see the meniscus in parts. So I think really, especially to, to get a feeling of the knee longitudinally, um, ultrasound is, is very, very good. Uh, CT, we are not doing that much. Uh, I know, in, for example, in Switzerland, they do many spec CTs, um, which is also a good uh, method for, for maybe deciding if something is going on in this area, if you have an inflammation. Um, but personally, for me, I do really many, every time I see the patient enter an ultrasound, and it really helps you to to get a better feeling on the knees. Okay, thanks. So Sigi, the first MOCAS was published now 15 years ago, more than 15 years ago. When you're now looking forward the next 15 years and you are publishing the MOCA 3.0 after 15 years, so what would be the change of this scoring? Or how do we see the future of MRI in, the, in cartilage repair? Yeah, this is a very good question. Um, tell it in this in this way. I think what we what we do at the moment is uh, we have named this MOCAD upgrade the MOCA 2.0 knee score, and this was uh, done because we work on the MOCAD score for the ankle joint because we know that there's a different situation where we have more osteochondral lesions there, and therefore. We want to have a dedicated MOCAD scoring for the ankle joint, which will be the MOCAD uh, score uh, or the MOCAD ankle score. And we also uh, work on a MOCAD score for the hip joint, uh, which um, uh, should um, consider the special characteristics of the hip joint, because we see now more and more cartilage repair surgery techniques in the hip joint. Therefore, I think it's really uh, important that we not only modify the MOCAD scoring for the knee joint, what we have done already. And I have no idea what we will do in 15 years with the MOCAD knee score. I expect that based on the more uh, or faster development in MR imaging, I think our image quality will significantly improve in the next 10 to 15 years. We will have faster scans and uh, higher spatial resolution. We will see more details. Maybe that also biochemical MR methods will be integrated already in clinical routine, like T2 mapping. And we will expand our MOCAD knee score to uh, from morphological also to some extent to biochemical analysis in the next 15 years. Maybe this will be part of the development. But at the moment, we are really focusing on uh, dedicated MOCAD scores for the ankle. Uh, the MOCAD ankle score, as well as the MOCAD uh, hip score. For the MOCAD hip score, we have already a name for it. It's the HOCAD, the HOCAD score, what we have already created, uh, but it's not yet finished. Um, yeah, these are the next steps. But for the knee score, we will see how the MR development will be within the next 10 to 15 years. 
questions and then we will adapt. So thank you very much uh, for the discussion. Um, um, I want to summarize, we had now the update of the MOCAD point two knee score and we had also the practical evaluation of MRI in athletes. I want to thank all the participants on this webinar from the ICRS. Please stay by the ICRS. The 16 World Congress is approaching in Berlin in Germany next April. The call for abstracts, the deadline is now the 15th October. So if you have any uh, publications or reports you want to present there in Berlin, just submit your abstracts. The next webinar from the RCS will be on Thursday, October the 21. It will be about hyaluronic based regenerative repair of the knee, which is a famous international panel. So stay tuned on the ICRS webinar and don't forget also to read the new open access journal, which is also coming from the ICRS, the Journal of Cartilage and Joint Preservation Open Access Journal for the ICRS. And if you want to be an ICRS member, become a member of the society. It's a professional network for cartilage repair and joint preservation. We have about 1,300 1, members in more than 65 countries. So I thank you very much for the attention here from Vienna uh, and uh, from Germany. Mozart, Mozart will stay with us. Mozart is always with us. So stay healthy and see you the next time. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.